And so if you're going to state that you refute somebody, well, then prove it. In this case, we don't have that. If you ever want to trigger a Pentecostal charismatic, then just mention anything regarding tongues anywhere where you disagree. For some reason, Pentecostal charismatics get triggered at any notion that their understanding or any difference in tongues is mentioned. How do I know? Well, recently I did a video covering Tiffany Montgomery, who is without question a false prophet, a false teacher. And there was a little bit of mentioning, probably about a minute, minute and a half long worth of something regarding tongues. Well, in that, that clip was taken and then brought to, or I guess used by a Bendigo Lufi, who I think is a pretty decent young fellow. Uh, I disagree with his doctrine. I think that he has he has to tighten up on doctrine. And I'm saying that as I'm going to also send this to him because I want to show him and others what I mean by doctrine, by sound teaching. I think there is a problem when it comes to us understanding how to read the scriptures, just like we ought to read everything else. I'm not saying him or anyone else have they have a lack of comprehension skills. What I'm saying is how we look at the, te the text and ultimately what some people end up doing is making the text to say what they want it to say. In other words, the conclusion is the issue. If you speak in tongues and believe that uh, someone's version of tongues is the correct way to do it and you explain it, well then, because their conclusion is that tongues, today's tongues, are the way it's supposed to be done, well then their conclusion is what you said is true. If you use the exact same standard, the exact same measure, then and come to a different conclusion, well then you don't have the Holy Spirit. Meaning this, if I use the Greek to show that this understanding, or I use another text to say this, well then all you all you have is just head knowledge. But if I use the exact same thing and come to the conclusion that they want to hear, well then that was wonderful. So let me go ahead and jump into what Abednego says, and then we'll jump into it. I really wanted to just really respond to his um, um, to his challenge. To his challenge, all right, uh, just with a verse, all right. Um, so let's play the video first, and then I'll give you guys some Bible. I'll give you guys a Bible verse, all right. So let's go ahead. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play what I stated, and I know I want you to notice what I said. I'm going to say that there are no examples in the Bible where someone is speaking in tongues in an unknown fashion. They don't know what they're saying, and they are being commended for that. Maybe he didn't quite hear it. Maybe he didn't quite get it. So perhaps I needed to be a little bit clearer. But I think those that listen to what I've stated all along understand the point that I've been trying to make. First of all, she says, I'm going to declare tonight that you're going to get your prayer language. And I'm still waiting. I am still waiting for the person with any biblical understanding to show me in the Bible a prayer language that is not the language of the person that's speaking. A prayer language where the person is praying and they don't know what they're saying and that be committed. Give me one. Matter of fact, I'm ready to shut the channel down. Now, notice what I stated. I said, well, they stated that and they are to be commended. And the issue is... Uh, there is no such thing, no such example in the Bible of an actual prayer language. That's the point. So much so, so confident am I is, you know what, if there is, if there's one in the Bible, well, then I'll just shut the channel down. Why would I say something like that? Because there is no example of someone having a prayer language, an actual prayer language. So we'll come back to that in a little bit, but that's where we are right now in this, in this portion of the video. I will shut the channel down because there is no such thing as a prayer language or, let me put it this way, a heavenly language or an angelic language. How do angels talk to people in the Bible? Well, with the same language that the person speaks with. When an angel spoke to Moses, when an angel speaks to Hagar, when an angel speaks to Joseph, when an angel spoke to Mary, when an angel spoke to anyone, or Daniel, anyone in the Bible, how they speak to them? spoke to them in the language that they could understand. And then how did the person speak back to the angel? In the language that they spoke. And so it appears to be if there was a such thing as an angelic language or a heavenly language. Seems to be whatever language it is that comes out of your mouth. Now, before he goes in and makes his comment, uh, his rebuttal or his refutation, let me just say this. When you want to offer a refutation, when you want to refute or disprove someone, what you don't do is just go to a passage, read the passage, and say, see, this disproves it. No, that's not how it works. You have to say why this disproves it. Why do I say that? Because he's going to go over a passage that I've covered over and over again. And it's almost so people think that I haven't read these passages. I've read the passages and I've given my interpretation of what I'm saying. If you disagree, 
fine. Don't just say you're wrong there. I have refuted you or hey, there I've disproved you or even reading the passage. All you've done is stated, I disagree with you. Here's a passage. I disagree with you. No, show the passage. Tell us why this passage refutes what I'm saying, why this passage um, makes your point. He does not do that. And that's one of the issues. That's one of the things that we try to get across over here is if you're going to have a point, make your point with the scriptures. Don't insert an opinion. Exegete the text. Use good hermeneutics and exegete the text. He does not hear. Really quickly. All right. Um, I'm going to give him a verse, right? It's, it's going to be clear as day. I don't think you can refute this Bible verse, right? This is Bible speaking. This isn't a Bendigo speaking. This is Bible. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, no, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 uh, through to 15. Um, it says, for if I pray in a tongue, which reveals there's a, there's a tongue, there's a prayer language. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. Now, this is in the AMP version. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive because it does not understand what my spirit is praying. Then what am I to do? I will pray with the spirit by the, by the Holy Spirit that is within me, and I will pray with the mind using words I understand. I will sing with the spirit, and then I will also sing with the mind using words I understand. So Apostle Paul is speaking here that he, when he begins to pray in tongues, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what he's saying. So he's saying his solution is that he will begin to pray in tongues, then also pray in the language he understands, right? And this is confirmed in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. It says for any... Now, before he goes to that, I want you to just pay attention to what he just says before we go to 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He literally said exactly what I just said. He did not disprove me. He proved me. Again, I said there is no example of anyone in the Bible speaking or praying in a tongue. And we'll talk about praying in a tongue in a second. But in a tongue and them not understanding it. And then, and then they be commended for it. Now, remember... This book is a book, this letter is a letter of rebuke to the church in Corinth. Paul starts off by saying, and let's just keep this in context, because I think context is very important. We'll deal with that in just a second as well. But he says, now concerning the pneumaticon, the spiritual things, things of the spirit, I do not want you to be ignorant or unaware. The word that's used here is agno ain, ignorant, unaware. Some versions literally say ignorant. This might, this version in ASB says unaware. So he says, I don't want you to be unaware. Let's go back to chapter 14, verse 14. As a matter of fact, let's go previous to that. Let's go up a little bit further and let's see what he's saying. Now, Paul is talking about how there ought to be some understanding. He's, talks, he's using uh, musical instruments such as the, the bugle or the flute or the harp. He says, even these things they, if they do not produce a produce a distinction in the tone, how will you know? How will it be known what is played? People will not understand. So, so also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For there you will just be speaking into the air. That's not a compliment. That's a put down. That's a rebuke. That's an admonishing by Paul. There are many different kinds of languages in the world, and each one, each kind is with that. It's not without meaning there's you know what's being stated if i do not know the meaning of the language i will be to the one who speaks a barbarian so also since you are zealous for spiritual gifts or the pneumaticone seek to abound for the building up of the edification of the church now because we're keeping this in context now abednego here's what he's saying keeping all of this in one train of thought therefore what's the therefore what is it therefore regarding what he's speaking about understanding, knowing that you and everyone else can be edified, that the church, that the body can be built up. He says, therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. This word right here, uh, dear, dear meneu, mean, or meneu means to understand, to get understand, to explain. That's what interpretation is. It's not like you would think as a maybe the UN where someone is speaking and someone matter of fact, it kind of really is. It's just basically giving the person that's hearing a way to understand what's being spoken. It's not necessarily a verbatim uh, 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 interpretation. It's just really just letting the person know what they're saying so that everyone knows 
uh, what's being spoken of. In other words, uh, or another way of putting it, if you don't understand what's being spoken, you two have nothing in common. You can't even sit in the same room because you don't know what the person is saying to you, about you, or for you, and you can't be edified. There cannot be any growth, and so there cannot be an agreement at whatsoever if one party is completely oblivious to what the other person is saying, especially if it's you. And so going back to what he says, then he says, for, this starts off with for, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Meaning, now, unfruitful is not a good thing. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant or unaware. So does Paul want your mind to be unfruitful? What then is the outcome? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with my mind also. Now, I want you to focus on what's highlighted here. This word, t un esten. This is what even Abednego highlighted. What's the solution? What's the problem? This is also brought before. So when you see this, this, this phrasing is to answer a problem. It's the solution. Like we see here in Acts 21, 22, when, when they are given Paul instructions on dealing with some of these Jews who are also converts versus the Gentiles, the, the phrase is what then is to be done? T un esten. So in other words, what's the solution? Well, if there is a solution to be given, solutions are given to what? problems. Something needs to be corrected. Something needs to be fixed. And so we go back to the past says, if I pray in a tongue. Now, here's the question, and this is what Abednego needs to address and everyone else. Does the word if imply that Paul prays in a tongue? Why do we go from assuming that the word if here, let me pull this down so you guys say, this word if in the Greek, an, means Paul did. If doesn't always, if shouldn't if mean if. So why do we take it that Paul says that he prays in a tongue? Give me the passage that says that this passage does not say Paul prays a tongue. Now, does it say that he doesn't pray in a tongue? No, but it says if Paul prays in a tongue or if I pray in a tongue. If we go to 1 Corinthians 13, we see if all the time. If I have the gift of prophecy, well, he does. But if I also have uh, no all mystery and knowledge, which Paul does not. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, Paul did not. If I surrender my body to be burned. Uh, now, so the question is, does if mean, is if an actuality? Or does if means if this were to occur? Paul is not stating that he prays in a tongue. He, what he's doing is, remember, Paul is trying to bring about correction with, with them, for them. If I pray in a tongue, well, so let's leave that to the side to say that if Paul, because we, we cannot conclude conclusively that Paul prays in a tongue. But whoever it is, even if it were Paul, isn't there a problem? There is a problem because there's a solution. And what's the solution? This is where the, the admonishing is. This is where... Paul is not, no one is to be commended for doing so ignorantly, unaware, with their mind unfruitful. What's the solution? The solution is, is I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with my mind also. Do you understand now? And so you did not find a passage that disproved my point. You stated a verse that you thought, but then even in that, you turned around and gave the exact response, the exact understanding that bolsters my point when you said, what is Paul's solution? In tongues, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what he's saying. So he's saying his solution is that he will begin to pray in tongues, then also pray in the language he understands, right? And this is confirmed. So now, again, that's him saying what I just said. Paul is giving the solution to what you should do. Don't pray with, with without understanding, pray with understanding. So, so he's saying the person that does pray in a tongue, what does that person do? If the person, whoever it is, prays in a tongue, your spirit prays, amen, but your mind doesn't. Your mind is unfruitful. So what should you do? Instead, pray with understanding. Now, he's also going to go to 1 Corinthians 14, too. I'll come back more to this in a second, uh, and then we will kind of recap and show how we've got to do a much better job of interpreting the text, reading the text, explaining the text. We've got to do a better job of having good Bible hermeneutics so we can have good sound doctrine. Confirmed in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue or pray, prays in a tongue uh, does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. And I want to just use those two verses. And that's really it. And I'll read uh, 
1 Corinthians 14, 14 in a different translation. Um, it says in the New King James Version, it says, um, for if I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, but my, but my, but my. Un now let's, let's hold on. Let's, let's go back to what he just said here before we go back to 14. In 14 too, all he did was read the text. That's my point. If all you're going to do is read the text and say, here, you're wrong here. Look at this text. Well, okay. I've read this text, this text several times. You, if you're going to teach people, you've got to teach people. If you're going to lead people, you got to lead people. Don't just say, hey, you're, you're not you're not a guide, a tour guide for people that are sightseeing. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's verse two of chapter 14. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's verse one of chapter 12. No, what does this mean? Exegete the text. He did not. He just went there. So let's go to the text and let's exegete the text. Now, Chapter two, verse two comes after verse one. So let's just read what he's saying. Again, keeping this all in context, pursue love. So what should we be after? Pursuing love, love. Um, then he says, Zalute de ta numatikan, which is, um, but yet or earnestly desire the gifts of the spirit. Well, it's not the gifts of the spirit. It's actually numatika, which is the spiritual things. If you want to say spiritual gifts, that's fine. But it's literally the things of the spirit, the spiritual. So desire the spiritual. Why should you desire the spiritual things or the things of the spirit? Because again, we said the gift of the spirit is the spirit. That's why it's written this way. And so why should you desire that? In order, Milan de Henna, Prophet, whenever you see this word henna in Greek, it's telling you the reason why the previous statement was made. This is the purpose clause, the purpose of what was stated. In order that you prophesy. Well, do you mean to have the gift of prophecy? No, in order to bring about revelations, what the word means to, revel to, to give a re revelation, to reveal, to utter, to tell, to inform. Inform what? Of what God is saying, of God's word, the gospel in that nature. Now we get to verse two. Keep it in context. Four. How do we know this is piggybacking off, off of verse one? Because we have the word, the Greek word gar, or in the English, four. For one who speaks in a tongue, and by the way, this is a singular tongue, does not speak to men, but to God, Paul is not commending them or saying you should. Now, I, I take it this way. Others would disagree, but they're going to have to give some sort of reason other than, well, it seems to be saying that. Well, why does it seem to be saying that? I'm telling you, it seems to be saying that he's giving a rebuke. A con He's contrasting what you should do versus what you should not do. How do I know he's contrasting? Because right after he says this person who speaks in this and some versions might say unknown tongue, to, in some verse, the King James, New King James, to show that this is a person that's not doing it correctly. An unknown tongue, which we've never seen an unknown tongue in the Bible. The one time that phrase shows up is right here. So, and by the way, the word unknown is not there, but it's brought out in other versions and translations to highlight that. So he says, um, does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but in his spirit, he speaks mystery. Now, mo most modern translations will have in his spirit. Truth be told, we don't know if it's in his spirit or in the spirit because this is one of those times where it's just difficult to tell. And so this word um, in the spirit or in his spirit, it can be taken either or. If it's in his spirit, well, then this person is out of order. If it's in the spirit, well, is it the spirit of his or the spirit of the Holy Spirit? Doubtful that it's the Holy Spirit because in the spirit, you're speaking mysteries to God. Well, we don't speak mysteries to God. Where is that ever given? There's no such Bible verse that tells us that we speak mysteries to God. We are, so are we informing God of something he doesn't know? No, that's why most translators, most most grammarians, not all don't, but most grammarians will take it that it's in his spirit. But how do we know Paul is contrasting what you should do versus what you should not do? Remember verse one, he says, in order that you prophesy, the whole point of these things are to prophesy, to bring about a revelation, to do what? To build the body up. How do we know? Because remember, the Bible already told us earlier, and I'm sorry, I went to the wrong passage, where in Peter, oh, here it is. So Peter, 1 Peter 4.10, he tells us, as each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another. And every time you see this brought up about spiritual gifts, be it 1 Peter 4, be it uh, Romans, a couple times in Romans, uh, you're going to always hear about spiritual gifts being used for the building up of the body. As a matter of fact, Paul says it over several times in chapter 12 as well as about seven or eight times in chapter 14, that we should be building up the body. 
So now going back to what he said in verse two, he says, especially that you would bring a revelation, that you would utter, that you would tell, that you would inform, that you would bring prophecy, not the gift of prophecy, because we can't desire that. Um, but even the gift of prophecy brings about prophecy, the gift of teaching, the gift of, the gift of, of knowledge and so forth brings about a revelation of God. So, so he says, how do we know he's contrasting one verse to the other? Because we have this word, but, which is a word of contrast. Day in the Greek is just like it is in English, but contrast this, 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 but this. Well, what's after the but is not like what's before the but. But the one who prophesies, which is the same Greek word, the same word that's used in verse one, speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consultation. So what does Paul want us to do? He wants us to exhort others. That's important. Every single spiritual gift is used to exhort others. Even if you want to go to Jude um, uh, verse 20, we don't have passages that tells us to build ourselves up. We don't have that. Let's go to Jude 20. He says, but beloved, and for some reason they take this as to be speaking in tongues. It's not, but beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. This is not to be taken as you building yourself up, but but even if a person wants to say it's you building yourself up. Now, it's the plural you and the plural yourselves. So it should be taken as you all building each other up. But even if you want to take it, hey, you all build each other up, yourself up. They're not doing it within spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts are not implied here. Because you see the word praying in the spirit. Well, we're supposed to pray in the spirit. What does in the spirit mean? Just do a word study and just look at every time the word in the spirit is used. You're going to find out that it doesn't mean in tongues. David did not come. Paul did not go in tongues. These are in different passages. You'll see the word in the spirit being used. It's not referring to uh, uh, in tongues. It's by the power of being used by in conjunction with the spirit. So how should you pray in conjunction with the spirit? So if you want to say that this is um, you building yourself up, it's not a spiritual gift because there is no spiritual gift of prayer. God has not given you the spiritual ability to pray. No, but he wants you to pray um, as a as a way of relationship and connecting with him. But prayer, just like reading the Bible, is not a spiritual gift. So let's go back to listen to what he's saying some more. And again, he does not ask you the text to tell you why he has refuted me. My understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and also pray with understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I'll also sing with the understanding. So Apostle, so Apostle Paul is saying here that when he would pray in a tongue, he would not understand. His mind would be unfruitful. He doesn't know what's being said because the spirit is praying. So what his solution, like I said earlier, is to pray in words he understands so his mind is fruitful. Right? That's 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 all I really wanted to respond. And so you did not respond. You, you did not refute. You did not give a text. Let me say it again. There is no such example in the Bible of someone uh, praying or speaking in tongues. They not know it and they be commended. That was my challenge. Go back and listen to what I said. That's, that was the challenge. You cannot find it. As a matter of fact, even the example you brought up, Paul is not commending them. Paul is saying, here's how you fix it. There's a solution. So you can't use that. There is no such example of someone having a prayer language. As a matter of fact, there's no such example of anyone in the Bible praying in tongues. There's no such example of anyone in the Bible having a heavenly language. There just absolutely is none. Now, think about this. If you're going to say that this is where this is some sort of edification comes in, we've got a huge problem. Matter of fact, every gift that we see in the New Testament, every spiritual gift that we see in the New Testament, uh, we also see in the Old Testament or prior to the cross, with the exception of modern day tongues or languages. In the new, with gifts, we see prophecy. Now we're seeing God saying that people can have that, that gifting as well who aren't called prophets or, or it's not a special group of people. We see healings in the Old Testament. We see healings in the New Testament. God gifting people in the New Testament to heal. We see God gifting people in the New Testament to raise people from the dead. We see that in the Old Testament. We see God gifting people in the New Testament to help, to teach, to lead. We see that in the Old Testament. What we don't see in the uh, Old Testament as we see in the New Testament, that is, if you believe that tongues are an ecstatic language, a heavenly language, 
we don't see that in the Old Testament. Now, if tongues are an actual language, we see that in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. So what we really see is if tongues are, as I say, an actual known language, all we see is God gifting people to be able to do that as he chooses when he so chooses and not coming up with something brand new. As a matter of fact, we even see someone in the Old Testament bringing about interpretation. Think about Daniel. Daniel in Daniel 5 is seeing and reading off what was being uh, read or written on the wall. Um, but then what that was was just simply, simply him reading the Aramaic and then interpreting the Aramaic. So he does exactly what we're supposed to have there. And so there, that way everybody knows, everybody understands. The issue was not just the handwriting on the wall, but the issue was the words they didn't know. And so someone brings about an understanding of what was stated. And so if you're going to state that you refute somebody, if you're going to state that you you have proof, well, then prove it. In this case, we don't have that. In this case, what Abednego did with, with, with in all uh, with all due respect, you did not do so. All you did was really, first of all, you actually stated what I said, that Paul Paul is offering a solution. You have to, when you say, I disagree, ladies and gentlemen, that this person is wrong, here's why. Um, verse 5 or verse 27 or chapter 1 or what have you says this, here's what it means, Here, here's why it means. That's how you refute someone. This is why we use the moniker, be smart. I'm not saying that he's not smart or anyone else, but I'm saying, in other words, don't just come to a conclusion because it's a conclusion you want. State why. In other words, like a math teacher would tell her students, prove or show your work. Now, the problem is, though, uh, is that we see this often. We see what happens is that people uh, get bothered because of tongues. Now, if you're telling me that tongues uh, is to edify oneself, fine. Show me another example of someone doing it to edify themselves. Don't Again, we can't go to Jude 20 because they're not speaking in tongues. We don't have an example of it. Verse 2, we, we covered what verse 2 is and how it's a contrast with what Paul stated in verse 1 and everywhere else in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And so it could not mean that he's showing how their misuse is and then him correcting and then going down to verse 14 what the solution is. And so if we're going to say that's how you edify yourself, well then... That means no one could edify themselves previously. How do people actually edify themselves? And so what I want to do now is I want to make another break and deal with something that's probably an even bigger point. And in order to see this point, you're going to simply have to click on the next video. This is the part where I'm going to speak candidly to all of my Pentecostal charismatic brothers and sisters. There's a big issue that you guys have, something that you guys might be in might be guilty of and I mean in guilt, guilty of a, a bad sin, which is the sin of idolization.